is Jamal Abdi, the president of the National Iranian American Council, NIAC. NIAC.org is the website. You can tweet him at J Abdi, J A B D I. Uh, Jamal, welcome back to the program. Good to be here, Tom. Great to have you with us. So, Donald Trump tweeted a threat to end Iran. I mean, end as in no right. more country. Uh, right. Tell me about this. Um, well, this is this is uh, I think Donald Trump's negotiating style. Um, I, I think he actually does really want a deal with Iran, um, and he would probably accept the you know the Obama nuclear deal if he could slap his name on it. But you know the he, he threatened to you know if Iran attacks the United States, uh, he would end Iran. He would end you know the you know uh, thousands of years of uh, of history and culture and people. Uh, but really, what his tweet said was what we're really concerned about, which is that the United States is sort of goading Iran into, uh, you know, either Iran or one of its proxies uh, doing something uh, against either U.S. forces or, um, you know, uh, uh, Saudi interests, uh, and that would actually provide uh, an invitation for U.S. military action. And I think that that's exactly what some within the Trump administration uh, are really aiming for. I think that uh, in the week since Trump's tweet, he's actually backed off of that point. And in Japan, uh, made it sound like he was desperate to negotiate with Iran. And so we've got this sort of uh, this policy that nobody can quite figure out what it actually is, because I don't think there actually is a policy. I think you have different uh, people within the administration who have their own aims and, you know, may the, may the most savvy operator within the White House win. So I, I've got a theory around this. I'd like to run it by you and and ask you, A, if you think my theory might have some, some substance to it, and B, if so, then what do we make of that? Um, Trump was a real estate developer his entire life. You know, he, he inherited uh, this, this uh, real estate em mini empire from his daddy, uh, along with 450 some odd million dollars. And so if he wanted to build a new building in in Manhattan which is where he you know really made his way um, and there was some little property owner who was holding out saying no I'm not gonna sell I you know I own this little corner building where I've got my little grocery store and 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 Trump you know and the, and the value of that little corner building let's say is a million bucks you just pull a number out of the air and Trump wants to pay 800,000 bucks for it and the guy who owns it wants 1.2 million uh, Trump's idea of a negotiation would be to go in and say to the guy, you know, you think you're going to get $1.2 million? You're going to get nothing. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to crush you into the ground. I'm going to build a building around you, and I'm going to seal you off, and you're going to end up at a crypt. There's going to be nothing left when I'm done with you. At which point the guy says, okay, okay, I'll take the $800,000. I, that, I am guessing that that's how he's been doing negotiations his whole entire life, you know, doing his bully routine um, and then ultimately, in more cases than not, probably getting what he wants. And it seems to me like that's what he's trying to do in international relations. He was threatening Kim Jong-un with uh, complete annihilation of North Korea. Um, he, he threatened China. Um, he's, I, you know, he, this is repeated over and over again and and you know most recently his threat to end Iran when in fact what he's trying to do is get to a negotiation and it may just be the only way he knows how to do it does that make sense to you I think that's completely right I think that that's uh, clearly <laughs> I don't know if you know Trump personally that sounds like everything that I've read about I, how I don't but I've read a lot in the president and um, I, actually I know people who know him personally in, okay. in New York in the real estate business so yeah yeah <laughs> it's I mean, this is this is an approach that maybe works with uh, Kim Jong Un, who you know wants to sit at the table with Trump, who who you know if he gets that meeting, it's a it's a big political win for him that he can take to uh, his airwaves at home and show how important he is to his people. With Iran, it's the exact opposite. Uh, it's actually it's not a matter of scaring Iran. Uh, to the table, which, you know, Iran's already at the table. It's the United States that left the table when we left the nuclear deal. But it's not a matter of scaring them. It's not a matter of Iran wanting something from the United States. Iran doesn't even necessarily uh, want sanctions relief that would allow the United States to uh, operate inside of Iran, because the, the leadership, the supreme leader, and, and many of the people around him actually really fear uh, U.S. influence inside the country, and you know, after the nuclear deal, which the current 
president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani, really staked his political fortunes on. Uh, the biggest threat that the Supreme Leader identified was uh, Western and specifically United States infiltration in Iran. So these guys actually view engagement with the United States uh, not as a favor or not even as a political benefit, but actually as something that comes with great cost. And they have now learned from the United States and from Trump that they will pay the political cost to actually negotiate with the United States and then have the rug pulled out from under them uh, on the whim of whoever the next president is. And so I think that, you know, if Trump really wants negotiations, he does have to follow the Obama approach, which was really predicated on signaling that uh, uh, concessions were in the offering and signaling that there was a respect there uh, and making it sort of politically uh, palatable for Iran's leaders to decide to come to the table. And he's done everything to the opposite of that. Well, in the last in the last day or so, he has he has said, you know, I hope. In fact, I think maybe he even said this in Japan, you know, that he hopes yeah. he can work something out with Iran. So we're now to the to the stage where he thinks he has intimidated the the you know the the little landlord, and but mm, apparently not so much. I mean, this it, it, the, the, I, th I think you're right. The dynamics here are so different than the dynamics with Korea, uh, with North Korea, and I don't know where else he has. Really, and and he hasn't won anything with North Korea. In fact, he's lost. Kim is is still building nuclear weapons, and now he's testing a whole brand new new uh, type of uh, missile. But Trump doesn't want to lose face. Um, do you yeah. think that if, I mean, it seems to me, Jamal, uh, we're talking with Jamal Abdi, the uh, uh, the president of the National Iranian Am American Council. It seems to me that Trump is is actually kind of a chump. Uh, you know, he, he's it's fairly easy to figure him out. Um, and that uh, Shinzo Abe has done so. You know, he, he has figured out that if you got, give this guy a bunch of pomp and ceremony, give him a bunch of flattery, and he'll give you what you want. Uh, you know, uh, Abe was terrified that Trump was going to put tariffs on Japanese cars. And I don't think Trump is going to put tariffs on Japanese cars anymore. Do you think that, you know, given how important face is, in, in many cultures, certainly in middle, many Middle Eastern cultures, and 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 given the, the the proud and legitimately proud history of Iran as a country that you know hasn't been conquered in hundreds of years, maybe maybe longer, a, a long-lasting you know empire as it were or nation, um, that they would be willing to do that kind of essentially groveling that uh, Shinzo Abe did uh, over the last weekend. Uh, to Donald Trump in order to get what they want, or is this is this going to be one of these things where the two sides are talking in such different ways, using such different frames and different worldviews, that uh, the outcome is probably going to be bad? And if it's going to be a bad outcome, how do you think it's going to play out? So, I, yeah, I, I don't think that the Iranians can really afford to 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 grovel. Um, you know, the the people that would be leading the negotiations. Are already being attacked as you know having having given up so much and got nothing in return from the previous negotiations that you know Trump left. Um, so so I think that's going to be very difficult. But I do know you know I've heard that um, the Iranians actually regret not taking Trump up on his offer to uh, not really an offer, but his you know he wanted to talk to Rouhani at the UN General Assembly. Right. Uh, his first year there in 2017, and he was he was rejected because he had given this speech that you know just was I mean, disrespectful is probably too polite a term to call what Trump does. Yeah, it was trashing uh, but Iran. Really, just trashing Iran. Yeah, and yeah. so the Iranians turned down a, a meeting, and you know normally they don't do those meetings anyway. And so I think that they really view that now as look, this guy will give up the store uh, if you stroke his ego ego a little bit. Now we've gotten to a point where I just don't know how that happens, and I do think that. The Iranians, by ratcheting up the pressure on their side, have actually kind of called Trump's bluff a little bit and leveraged Trump's uh, desire to actually not have a war and the fact that he's now seeing that his own advisors are leading him in that direction, so he's pulling back. And so I think both sides have kind of seen what the other is willing to do. And so, you know, hopefully in a, in a professional administration, you, you would actually have back-channel negotiations happening. You'd have some sort of process. I just don't know if these guys are... Uh, adept enough to do that, and the ones who are adept at actually manipulating the system and working in the bureaucracy are the people like John Bolton, who are doing everything they can, they can to make sure these talks never happen because they are afraid that Trump would actually strike a deal. Well, this is my concern about Bolton and Pompeo: 
is the you know these were both guys who who uh, very successfully managed to avoid going to Vietnam, but uh, they are just so enthusiastic about sending other people's children into into a war with Iran or any place else for that matter. I mean, they never neither of them ever saw a war they didn't like, and uh, that does not encourage me <laughs> at all. Um, uh, Jamal, we, we have just a minute here left before we hit a break. Uh, we're talking to Jamal Abdi, the uh, president of the National Iranian American Council. Is there anything that Americans can or should be doing to try to stabilize the situation? Is this the sort of thing that's amenable to our calling our members of Congress, for example, and saying, please consider so-and-so? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had high hopes for this this Congress, the, the Democratic House, uh, that you know, they'd be well positioned to respond to things like that, that, like what's happening. And you would think that with the possibility of a war with Iran being so uh, imminent that there would be more alarm bells going off. And we haven't quite seen that. We've seen a little bit of it. But um, in about two weeks, Congress will begin considering their annual defense authorization bill. And there is a push to include language in there that would bar any funding for a war with Iran and would make it very clear to people like Pompeo that you can't use any previous war authorizations and try to connect Iran to al-Qaeda or something like right. that to give cover for a war with Iran. And so, so Congress does need to hear that this is important, that this is a priority, so that they actually pass that legislation. There was a previous, previous attempt to actually pass this, and it was Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, in, the arm, uh, in the Appropriations Committee who hit the pause button on that. So we need to actually, we need to win the next time this comes up.